Okay, so I'll start with this case. Oops. Pull up the images and show our window. So this is um, a patient who's had a bone marrow transplant and developed a strider and cough. And I'm going to show you, let's see. This was a radiograph from the um, about a week before and doesn't look terribly exciting. And then I'm going to bring up the PA from the um, a week, about a week later. And in retrospect, I will show you the difference. But I want you to notice the caliber of the trachea has changed quite a bit uh, and a little bit of paratracheal stripe thickening. But, you know, very soft call and not, you know, we'll give you the caveat that it was in retrospect. But here's the CT scan we did on him looking for an infection. And you'll see that his trachea is diffusely thickened in a circumferential distribution, extending into the main bronchi and goes out to the periphery of the lungs. And he's breathing everywhere. He's had a hard time holding his breath. Now we had a CT from before, about a month before, that showed a normal looking airway. So I don't think he developed amyloid overnight or anything like that. So, uh, you know, the, the suspicion for infectious tracheitis was raised. And here are the bronchoscopy images, which are really kind of cool. And the pulmonary fellow actually put in the put little uh, descriptions in there for us. But you can see the level of the vocal cords and you see the, all the little patchy white stuff everywhere. And then we go, oops, I'll go the other way. There we go. Distal the vocal cords. You can see uh, in the trachea, there's these little patchy areas along the mucosa. Further down, it looks even uglier. Lots of erythema and then these patchy white exudates just everywhere. It's interesting how nodular it is compared to the CT, which is much smoother. Uh, so they did, and then at the carina, all these little plaques here are abnormal. So this is acute tracheitis. They uh, haven't isolated an organism yet. I presume it was bacterial since he um, was given antibiotics and nothing grew. I've seen uh, Cryptococcus do this and Aspergillus can do this as well. Um, but pretty uncommon for adults to see acute tracheitis, but and he was immune suppressed. But I thought it was a nice case with the correlation and the uh, bronchoscopy. Okay, let's see. Um, here are two cases sent to me from uh, the guys in Augusta, Georgia. Um, this, let me show green here. All right, so this was a patient who um, had had um, a, a hernia repair and developed some sh shortness of breath and chest pain after the surgery. And this was the initial radiograph. And you can see there's this gas-filled structure. The heart's displaced to the right. There's a little bit of edema. And then you can see this is relatively confined. And uh, this was um, mistaken. And there's uh, by the um, one of the, uh, did, say, the the service that did the, the surgery or whatever, I guess, interpreted this as a pneumothorax um, and not what it was and put a pigtail catheter in. And of course, you can see the catheter is in the pleural space and this collection is still here and uh, ultimately put, ended up putting in a larger bore drain. Now uh, you can see there's a, a tube down here at this point. Um, and you try to feeding tube, but you can see where the feeding tube goes, tells you exactly what this was if you haven't already figured it out. But this is the stomach. And what had happened is during the uh, repair, there was either um, an, an, an injury to the diaphragm or it was pre existing and there was tension on it, but the stomach had herniated into the chest and um, was misinterpreted by uh, non radiologists as being a pneumothorax. I guess on the, if you go back to the original, failed to appreciate this is contained by the, um, the upper wall of the stomach and there's displacement of everything to the right. So an iatrogenic, um, what do we want to call it, gastrothorax, and there's the NG tube coursing into the intrathoracic stomach. So they went back in and fixed it, but a good pitfall case, a good medical student case, and a good surgery intern case. Jeff, <clears throat> Jeff was that was that a hiatal hernia repair and was that, do you think that stomach got into the chest Again, through the hiatus, or do you think there was a separate hole in the diaphragm? I think there was a hole in the diaphragm. Separate hole from the from yeah. there. Yes, and I've seen this before. We had a case here where that happened, where you know they pecked they um, the diaphragm is probably weak or it's thin, and when they do the repair, there's tension, or you know, in it, as they're taking down the stomach, there's you know an unrecognized injury to the diaphragm. 
So it's a, it's a known complication. It's not very common, but I have seen it before here. Uh, we recognized it pretty quickly on the radiograph because you got a collar sign. This one, the entire stomach made it up. But I've included the op note as well in here. It's all there's a whole description in here that um, you can you know didn't come up on the screen, but you guys can you can look at it with the case. So yeah, this was that's what it was. It was a separate injury to the diaphragm. Okay, um, this was a kind of an interesting case. So this is, uh, I think everyone will like this for different reasons. Uh, let me show the screen. So this is a guy uh, from, this is 2006, and you can see he's got a nice case of silicosis. He's got these well-defined nodules, they're upper lobe predominant. He's even starting to form pseudoplaques. So that's 2006. Now I'm gonna jump ahead to 2000. Nine, just to show you the progression. At this point, he's developed some cardiac issues. He's got an ICD in place. We have a nice digital image. There's the nodules are more confluent. We're starting to see some uh, coalescence. These pseudo plaques along the periphery. You'll see a few calcified lymph nodes. And then this is 2017, right here. At this point, he developed a fever and a cough. He'd been sick for a few weeks. Had gotten several rounds of antibiotics. This is about a week before and was not responding. And if you look on the radiograph, the inspiration is smaller. Um, he does have this little area of opacity here, there, right where there we see the tethering of the fissure. Um, and then there's some sort of vague opacity of the infrahyalal region, hard to say what's going on. Uh, so they got a CT scan on him. I also have an old CT, but I'm not gonna show, but uh, it goes along with it. Hopefully the new CT, here's the new CT. And so, um, this was done to try to figure out why he was not responding to antibiotics. And what, what was seen is he's got a small effusion and then he's got this, what looks like sort of a bronchial or sort of a segmental lymph node, but this soft tissue nodule at the bifurcation of the basal airways. Another one with a tiny cavity, uh, more inferiorly. And then as we go all the way down to the bottom, there was this larger nodule, almost a mass here at the right base. It's got a few calcifications in it. Those are probably just gobbled up silicotic nodules. You can also appreciate the distribution, and now he's developed large opacities, so progressive massive fibrosis. He also has what looks like tracheomalacia as well. You can see he's got this sort of flattening of the cartilage. So um, the pulmonary service actually did a bedside thoracentesis. Uh, it looks like a small effusion, not terribly exciting, but they were they um, on the stain the um, the gram stain or the the, the stains of the of the pleural fluid. Uh, the uh, micro lab identified a dimorphic yeast, budding yeast that was blastomycosis. So this is an unusual manifestation in that it involved the pleura um, because usually it's in the lung and it's either a dominant mass or a large area of consolidation. I've shown you several cases recently. I've not seen one that sort of follows this more discrete nodule pattern and it may have something to do with the structural lung disease. And so the question was is, well, does he have disseminated disease because the pleura involvement would be unusual? And lo and behold, uh, one of the student clinicians decided to examine the patient a little closely and notice this on his face. And you'll see this little black ulceration, little crater, very typical of blastomycosis of the skin. So this is disseminated blasto in a guy with silicosis. And I know David's going to ask me what, what job he had. I'm still trying to figure that out because he's got about a decade worth of clinical notes, and I'm sure it's buried in there but um, he's from a part of Wisconsin that has some industry. So I suspect it was probably foundry work. <clears throat> and he does like to camp and he and his wife had been camping um, in the fall and Blasto, you, know, you can have a, a latency sometimes of, of several months, but I, I suspect it was probably too far out given it's already February, but uh, we've had a Late, lately, we've had a warmer than usual winter, so the ground is not frozen. So it's possible if he was outside, he picked it up there. Okay, going along the infection uh, route, this is, let me show you the images. This is a, this is a 25-year-old who developed um, swelling in the neck. This is a, a non-con neck CT. And you'll see there's a lot of uh, enlarged lower cervical, kind of posterior triangle, supraclavicular lymph nodes that have not, not they're fairly homogeneous in attenuation, and even a larger one extending into the upper chest. As we go into the mediastinum, you start seeing them. And then uh, here's the chest CT, and you can see there's faint calcium in these nodes. It almost looks like sarcoid. 
but uh, this patient had more systemic symptoms and they actually uh, sampled one of the neck nodes and got uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. So I suspect this is subacute scrofula and David had shown that case with the calcified nodes in the scrofula pattern. And this is sort of the same thing extending in the mediastinum, but this one is more mimicking of sarcoid. And honestly, I would have called this sarcoid had I not known about the neck nodes and, and the, the fact that they have the other symptoms because it looks an awful lot like sarcoid. So this is probably healing scrofula masquerading is what looks like sarcoid. I don't know. Uh, I think the patient was from an endemic area, was an immigrant from I want to say uh, sub-Saharan Africa, if I remember correctly. Um, another infection case, this was kind of, this is just kind of fun because it's a different modality. As you may or may not know, we do a fair amount of pulmonary MRA here, uh, especially in our younger patients. And this patient had come in with chest pain and they were looking for a pulmonary embolism. And here's one of our studies and you can see it. It's a nice study. We can see the, the big clots if they're there, but there's no PE. But what was noticed were these nodules in the lungs, and you'll see that there's, they're, they're enhancing peripherally. As I scroll through, you'll see there's a lot of them uh, out in the periphery. This one's got a pretty sizable cavitary portion of it. And there, as you scroll through, they're here and there. There's another one down here at the base. So, you know, multiple peripheral nodules with central non-enhancement. You think about septic emboli, and this was a neck CT just confirming that indeed these do look like septic emboli but on an MRA. So we can pick them up on an MRA too, but very pretty example of that. So just a, a different modality to see those. Um, From intravenous drug abuse, or was there a reason for septic emboli? I don't remember. I can't remember. I can't remember if the patient, I don't think it was a drug use. I think it was a patient just had got with septic, which we're see, I'm seeing now a lot more in patients who are septic, who develop septic emboli, but aren't necessarily IV drug users. Um, let's see. Um, oh, this is kind of cool. Okay. This I'll, I'll show this one as my, uh, last one here. So this is a patient. I'm going to pull up the images here for you in a second. This is a patient who was diagnosed with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And let me find the old, older images. Um, let's see. And w this is the pre, uh, let's see, that's, old. I think I have somewhere in here. I thought I had a surgical one. I don't have the old radiographs, but uh, this patient had actually been referred elsewhere for an endarterectomy and then developed some problems afterwards. So I'm going to show you the, uh, the VQ scans are probably the best. So this is the V, this is the perfusion scan from 2000, uh, 2015 here. And you can see uh, there's just a, a little bit of a defect, but there's not real, not real bad. I believe this was post endarterectomy. So the patient was doing pretty well following treatment, but then became short of breath again. Now, this is the new VQ scan. Let's see if I can put them up side by side here. And you'll now notice there are new defects. So we've got, this is old, this is post endarterectomy shortly thereafter. This is about two years later. There's now a defect in the right lung. And then you'll also notice there's decreased perfusion in the lung bases in particular. Jeff, I'm not seeing the, uh, the newer scan, just the old one. That is interesting. Now you probably only see the old one, right? the new one, right? New one now. Yeah, it's okay. letting me show them side by side. That's interesting. Okay, because um, I have both on my screen. But there's new defects in the lung. So presumably the patient had developed new thrombi. All right, so do you see a – that's interesting. That's really interesting. Okay, <laughs> try to fuse the VQ scan with a CT. Let's try this, um, just the CT now. Now you should see a contrast enhanced CT scan. So yes. see there's been a sternotomy, there's been a end arterectomy, so there's the arterotomy. But you'll notice that um, as we go down, the pulmonary artery here on the left just stops and it's contracted and, and filled. Same thing on the other side. You see the superior segment, but the basal segments drop out. And so this is recurrent thrombus in the lower lobes after endarterectomy in a patient who had been previously treated. So not only was she anticoagulated, she was still forming thrombi. And it corresponds nicely with the VQ scan because there were basal segment defects that were not present following treatment. Uh, the lung windows, interestingly, don't show really under perfusion, but a lot of atelectasis. So I guess that's accounting for the decreased perfusion. There's less ventilation. But she still perfuses her superior segments. 
there's contrast there. And then the, there's still a little bit of a, there's a little segment out here in the upper lobe. So this is the first time I've encountered a patient who was successfully treated, who then rethrombosed after the fact. So what was the time frame on the rethrombosis, Jeff? Uh, sometime in the, well, it, within two years, because the endarterectomy was in 2015. This was 2017. The, uh, but if you, the appearance to me is this is not acute PE, this is chronic. So there's been some time. So I don't know if it was a gradual process, if they went at the same time or not. And it, what you can also see the diminished venous return sort of on both sides. They're corresponding with the decreased perfusion. So over the course of two years, she became more short of breath again, and her RV pressure started going back up. And um, so it's recurrence. I've not seen it. So I thought that was kind of interesting. All right. I think that's all of them. Who would like to? Okay. I have. I have a few ready. I don't know who else is on here, David. If you have any or not, David, I, uh, it's pretty, pretty slim pickings for me here. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to show you this screen in just a second. But Jeff, your audio was cutting in and out, so I don't know if it's just low bandwidth on my side. So hopefully, it doesn't become an issue here. I hear you loud and clear, David. Did you hear me cutting out, or did you hear me fine? No, it was you. You were okay today. All right. Okay. We'll blame the biscuits well, then. Yep, it's uh, yeah, our infrastructure in need of repair. This it's is a, one. Look, the blue state thing. You, you're you're living in a blue state now, so you're going to have huh. those. Problems. That's right. Um, so Jeff, I pulled this one up quick just to show as a companion to your case, and this is a lady who you can see right off the bat has a dilated and hypertrophied right ventricle, indicative of long-standing pulmonary pressure elevation. And I'll show you her lungs in a second, but you can see her main PA is dilated. And she does have some peripheral findings indicative of chronic thromboembolic disease, but it's not a lot of large central filling defects. She has a known history of PEs, but it's more just the distal vessels taper, and then you see these large, you know, these regional areas of mosaic perfusion with slightly decreased vessels in them. And this is an older study. I think it's kind of interesting, too, that this, I think, was an old infarct that just evolved into a scar, because I couldn't find any history of any sort of, um, of, any sort of, of infection. But this was her final preoperative study before she went to UC San Diego. And I don't know, maybe, yeah, maybe there's a little calcification here. Maybe it's a little granuloma. But you can see now just more large regional areas of mosaic perfusion with decreased caliber vessels and these linear things that most likely just represent scar, even some areas of maybe a little bit of bronchiectasis in the areas of, of decreased attenuation. But so long story short, she has chronic PE, goes to UC San Diego, gets a thromboendarterectomy, and then this was post-op day five after thromboendarterectomy, and she had worsening saturations. They did an echo and saw that her right heart function had reduced again. And now they did this CT, and this is post -op, about post-op day five. And so in her, this is acute rethrombosis. And you can see that she has all of these areas of filling de new filling defects. And some of them are a little bit more eccentric, so I, I, I'm guessing this is more in situ thrombus that formed just from doing the thromboendarterectomy. Uh, but yeah, I was, I was glad you reminded me of this case by showing yours, because this was um, just an acute a rethrombosis event. I've got the excerpt from their report in here where they say, you know, on, uh, yeah, this was like post-op day five. They saw that her pulmonary artery pressure was up. She, she had failure. So they just started her on anticoagulation and increased her heparin. And she improved. And I think now, let me see, I can't remember if I have I think I saw her with a follow-up study, and maybe I didn't. Maybe I just saw a follow-up radiograph. But I guess she got better and then had you know, subsequent VQ scans. This was the, um, you know, they're not perfect, but they're better than they were if you look at the LPO and the RPO perfusion scan. So this is something that was clinically suspected. We don't do thromboendarterectomy here. They all go to San Diego, but this was just acute rethromb rethrombosis. So, Jeff, do you, do you guys do them there at all or not? 
Um, we don't. We send them to San Diego too. And David, but you do them, right? Didn't you yeah. say there's some down at Washington? Right, we do quite a few. Right. And have you seen any uh, acute rethrombosis no, I complications? No, I have not. I have not. So <clears throat> yeah, and and I don't I, again. I don't have enough experience to know how often that happens, but you know, certainly the appearance fit. Yeah. Um, this is just more of a, a of a curious case, and this is a patient who came in with left-sided systolic failure, and you can see their left ventricle is dilated. This is a PE study. There's no pulmonary emboli. He does have some, I think he had some pretty subtle thrombus along the anterior wall of his LV right in here. You can see there's a little bit of low attenuation. It's a little focally thicker than it should be there, which is no surprise because his ejection fraction was really low. But I'm just showing this because it's a really interesting evolution. Here I would have, I would say edema, which is what we said. He's got some smooth septal thickening, some small effusions, and especially in the setting of his just dilated and failing left ventricle, a little bit of peribronchial cuffing and just generalized septal thickening. But this was a non-contrast study three weeks later, and I think it's really curious. You know, one of my colleagues showed me this to see what his lungs now look like. And, you know, we don't have a, a subsequent contrast-enhanced study, but, I mean, this looks like a massive infarct or what we would see with a hemorrhagic infarct. He didn't have any signs of PE, but you can see how it has, you know, the, uh, like the rind of higher attenuation and just that central ground glass, you know, in both of his lower lobes and then some air bronchograms centrally but not in these areas. So I didn't really have a great explanation for this. He, like I said, he wasn't immunocompromised, so this wasn't any sort of angioinvasive mucor or something like that. But I don't know if it's just hemorrhage from left ventricular failure and just giving you this kind of hemorrhagic infarction look or not. Um, I, I don't think they did a subsequent contrast-enhanced study, but they weren't really worried about PE. I was, but clinically they weren't. It, I don't know. Do you guys have any ideas? Back to the contrast sure? study and look at the pulmonary vein. Because that's the entire lung yeah. below. Yeah. Oh, it's wide open. Yeah, the pulmonary veins are. Yeah, I know. It's, and even here, you know, yeah, that was one thing I looked for. I don't know. I was it's just bizarre. That there was something hiding down in there. Yeah, because his ejection fraction was less than twenty percent. Go go down so. a little bit on that old scan. A little bit more. Yeah. Round that yeah, back hole. It, that almost look. Go right there. Go back. Go right there. Yeah, I know. It looks in far. It looks like both of these there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, and unfortunately, I think the study, either the study cuts off here or I just didn't have the... Right. Um, there, I, I, must have, I must have just lost the... Uh, yeah, it's like the a right full there. series. I know, it does. Yeah, so, right, so that's the other question. Is it just evolution of, of small infarcts to one more confluent? Because I, I, I can't think of anything else that looks like this other than, you know, mucor in the appropriate context. And this yeah. looks to me like these huge hemorrhagic infarctions. Yeah. <clears throat> So, was there any unfortunately, up, uh, we'll never know. Past this, Travis? No, no, he was discharged, and he wasn't he wasn't doing that poorly. Uh -huh. So I don't know. I have no idea. But all right, Jeff, I wanted to save this one for you. Okay. Since we were gone last week, I thought you would like this, and I think David will like this too. And this is one I saw recently, and I don't have confirmation on this, but I suspect that I know what's going on here. And you can see this is a guy who has cough and he has these nice circumscribed perivascular cysts. Again, this vessel kind of goes along the cyst and almost indents it a little, but not in it. It's not the typical distribution of what you would see with Berthog de Bay. It's man, so it's certainly not lamb. And um, so then I was looking for any nodules or anything to suggest that this could be amyloid. He doesn't have a history of connective tissue disease. But the one thing he does have is a history of, of multiple myeloma now, which kind of, I think, seals the, the diagnosis. And when they looked, the biopsy showed that he had light chain. It was a kappa light chain amyloid, or sorry, myeloma. So I think this has to be light chain deposition slash amyloid, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. <laughs> and so the, he was just recently diagnosed with myeloma, but if he had, and I don't think he ever had any sort of diagnosed 
monoclonal gammopathy or any sort of, you know, but he's probably had a pre-existing light chain deposition for some time. Would that be your speculation? And have you seen cases like this? Uh, I would, yeah, I mean, that would make the most sense because it takes time for these to develop and, you know, they often don't get diagnosed right. until someone either checks it or they develop some weird symptoms. Yeah, well, he just has cough and that is also the issue now that he's on treatment for his my multiple myeloma. I don't know if these are going to explain, if they're enough to explain cough, just having this, you know, relative paucity of cysts. Yeah. Um, Does his airway look okay? Travis, no uh, thickening of the airway or anything? No, I mean, I think it's all just normal cartilage here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think it, I don't think we'll ever get path proof on this, but he does have, like I said, a kappa light chain myeloma, so I think this has to be a light chain deposition disease mm -hmm. along that amyloid spectrum. But I don't know, Jeff, what t types of symptoms do these patients even get? Because usually with these amyloid ones, well, you know, I just see them as incidental you, findings. There's another form of light chain. I don't remember it, but it tends to affect the kidneys. It's not associated with myeloma. And it's usually younger patients, and they get renal failure. But okay. this, you know, I mean, it looks exactly like LIP because it's the same phenomenon. Right. It's getting different types of proteins dropped into the lung and obstruct the air. Right. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess they could get a spontaneous pneumothorax in theory, but... Renal failure is the one that I associate with light chain deposition disease. Yeah, okay. So, but yeah, well, that I, one. Why do you had that? Because we have a case, I, I, I just got the path back, but I'll show it next time. It's a amyloidosis that's uh, AL amyloid. It's kappa, it's kappa light chain, but it's it's all nodules. Huh. This, you know, you get that sort of nodular form of amyloidomas, but I'll show that next week too. And same cool. phenomenon, but different appearance. Um, this is a radiograph. This is an interesting case because this uh, was one that was read in the ED and this patient came in with altered mental status. You can see, well, you know, there is an asymmetric opacity of the right lung apex. This was not detected in the emergency department and it does come to the, it, it does correlate with his altered mental status. And I think it's kind of an interesting case because he's middle-aged man and of course first and foremost you think about some sort of cancer but when he got a CT a few days later and you see that you know, this looks not as much cancerish just because you have a I think a little looks like almost a little cavity and necrosis with air in there and also just tons of little satellite nodules and a little bit of adjacent bronchial wall thickening and you can see you know all these little things and they, and I don't remember the exact time course, but the reason they were doing this was screening for cancer because of he had some lesion in his brain, but they subsequently diagnosed him with meningitis. And I think it's, it's just a nice radiograph, and then it goes to show when we got a follow-up, now he has a VP shunt because of his meningitis that um, you know, took its toll on that, and that this is, you know, this opacity is still there. It had gotten a little bit smaller, but in the meantime, on their CSF study, they were growing out uh, coxy from this, from, from his CSF. So he had coxy meningitis, and I think this is almost certainly just coxy infection in the lung, and so it was a disseminated coccidioidomycosis. And, you know, everybody was worried about lung cancer at first, I guess. Well, not everybody. I was less worried just given that all of these satellite nodules making me more thinking about a granulomatous infection, which has turned out to be. So I don't have the follow-up CT, but they never biopsied this just because of the, the diagnosis of coccidioidomycosis and all these little satellite nodules. And this did get slightly smaller on, on uh, subsequent imaging. But just a, I thought a nice... Did he have any risk factors? Was he, um, besides ge geography? I can't, oops, that's not my teaching file. I can't remember. Let me see. Here, here's my report. Um, so I guess he came in for hydrocephalus. So, yeah, and so they did that to look for TV, which was called negative. So, and I guess they finally decided it was coxy. So I don't think he had any specific risk factors here, mm -hmm. like no, no HIV or immunocompromised or anything. But we see a lot of coxy just in patients that work 
you know, in the valley. It, you so, know, it's particularly devastating with with Filipinos in the valley, and um, I think but, with Mexicans. So it, it it is more likely to disseminate in people who have dark skin. Huh. That's one of the risk factors. I've, the most aggressive cases I've seen have been in Filipinos. So yeah, I think the, the important thing here is too that well, obviously this is a subtle finding, and especially when you look at the left, you see his his bones are well mineralized, but this definitely extends outside the bones. But also just because it's a mass doesn't mean it's cancer, especially when you have other findings worrisome for some sort of disseminated infection like meningi meningitis. So. That was a subtle radiograph. I've got a few more. Is there anybody else on here, Jeff, that has cases to show? Just this David. Is... Pressure's on. So I'm happy to keep going. I don't, I don't know if you have. Enough, Jeff. I'm sorry, David. I don't have anything good enough. That's fine. Well, we'll let Travis go, and when he's if he when he wants to call it quits, we can have a shorter webinar. That's fine. We'll. we'll... I mean, I've I've got a whole list of them. A lot right. of these are going to get into more, eye eye tests, but which are always fun though. This is one that came in over the holidays when I was working and this is an I, I can't remember it's an older woman but you know, and the diagnosis was known at the time of this radiograph but I certainly saw that she had this abnormal contour of you know, it looks like her descending thoracic aorta that's kind of obliterated here her aortic arch doesn't look that great either but uh, looked at the CT cause this was done as you can see overnight and um, this is just an interesting one because it's as you see that she has just focal, you know, the mushroom shape here. This is a great example of a mycotic aneurysm of her descending thoracic aorta. And I don't remember exactly if it was just pain she presented with or you know, what, the, what the precise presentation was. But you can see maybe a little bit of inflammation surrounding this. Now they went in and, let's see if I have the abdomen and pelvis. Yeah, and here's the second site, which also clues you in. This is a mycotic process. She's got multiple pseudoaneurysms, but they went in and repaired, resected a portion of her aorta, and this actually grew out strep pyogenes. So this was a group A strep uh, aortitis, and they said there was a lot of pus and whatnot in there when they took it out. Or sorry, uh, strep, no, not strep py uh, pyogenes, uh, strep pneumonia. So my apologies, it was a different strep, but that's kind of an unusual bug to cause an aortitis. And she didn't have any pneumonia at this time, so I don't know when her pneumonia was or how she got this, but it's kind of interesting. That's the first time I've seen a strep pneumonia cause uh, aortitis like that. So Travis, you made the point that it looks like a mushroom. Yeah. Uh, so our, you know, <clears throat> that that's, it was explained to me that that's where the term mycotic aneurysm came from because it looks like a mushroom. It often has right. a stalk and then bulges. So it wasn't that it's caused by fungus, which right. is what you think of the first time you hear that term mycotic aneurysm. It's really that it resembles a mushroom. Yeah, and this and this one definitely does. Even here, you've got it's a big mushroom cap on this thing. Right. And yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, that's what I've always been told too. So and I think this is a crappy outside study, so it's really hard to get a good coronal on it, but yeah. But it's a nice correlate for the radiograph. All right, let's see. There's one. Let me see. I'm going to have to turn on the names to find. There's one that I want to show you, which is just a really impressive. This, this case. Now, this is patient with middle-aged patient connective tissue disease. I don't think the diagnosis is any sort of surprise. You can see she's got lower lobe, somewhat symmetric and peripheral predominant opacities. But what is striking is just this pattern of her NSIP because this is one of the prettiest cases I've ever seen. I mean, you see a little subpleural sparing here and you know these almost look I don't even know, you know, reverse halo kind of almost an atoll, but the, I don't even they're so pretty. It's like almost a wave that's continuous here that this is one of the prettier cases of, of NSIP I've ever seen. So, Trav, I don't know how you, could I? Yeah, could I posit that what you're seeing is is organizing pneumonia on the edge of the of the injury? So that the the denser stuff is the biopsy, and you're just sort of 
doing that evolution into the NSIP appearance. Yeah, I think you're probably re right. And frequently, like, these are mixed patterns, yeah. So this is the organizing pneumonia. It's like the wave, yeah, here. And then that's the, the NSIP out more peripherally. You know what? It's, you should call it the oak leaf sign. It kind of looks like an oak leaf on the right. <laughs> yeah, I just thought it, I just wanted to share this one because it's so, it's so striking in its symmetry. And yeah, and you just have this very sharp little band, probably, right, the, 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 the um, interface of organizing ammonia, and then this is all the NSIP out here. And you can see how it's much more uniform in the basilar segments of the lower lobes. Is that what you would say? Yes. I kind of, yeah, I, I do kind of like oak leaf. Yeah. Um, what was interesting, right, and I think, you know, and I don't know what her treatment schedule was, but yeah, the, the organizing pneumonia, these are a couple months apart or a month apart. And yeah, the consolidation has decreased a little, presumably some, you know, some treatment effect of the, of the organizing pneumonia, but yeah, the NSIP stays there. And then I think I saw a more recent one and, um, yeah, and now it's, you know, you still got a little bit of residual NSIP, but just how it's evolved and how it's responded. So, I like that, the oak leaf sign. But this is just a particularly, we see a lot of NSIP, but this was just a particularly striking pattern. How about a, how about a reverse of oak leaf? Yeah, the, the, um, in, the inverted oak leaf. A flossy it's, oak yeah, it's, leaf. It's got hoarfrost. I don't know. <laughs> or um, but yeah, if, if anybody has any other suggestions on what to name this, I just thought it was such a pretty pattern. But I think, yeah, that Jeff, that's a good point that these are often you know, intermixed, organizing pneumonia and NSIP. Now, I'm, I missed your, when you showed that case of the lymphadenopathy and you had mentioned the possibility of you know, sarcoid but not sarcoid, I thought this was a good one. This is a patient who came in and, and has, as you can see, this abnormal left hilar or left mediastinal contour. And you can see even their aortic arch is a little indistinct. You don't really have much of an AP window here. It's not the best image. Um, but this one I, I like to show just because this is one where you know, the, the person reading this, the first thing they mentioned to the interventional pulmonologist was that this might be sarcoid because the patient was otherwise asymptomatic and immediately I don't like it for sarcoid and, and just because of the fact that it's not symmetric and it's you know strikingly asymmetric. It's involving only anterior mediastinal left-sided you know, supraclavicular nodes and left maybe some left hilar but no findings on the right side and there is old literature but it's all from the era of radiography but you know, the absence of symmetric and paratracheal, the typical distribution, you know, I don't usually think sarcoid at all, or at least much, much less likely. This actually turned out to be, a, an, I think it was a B-cell uh, lymphoma when they ended up biopsying it. But, Jeff, that case you showed, I don't know, did it have hilar lymphadenopathy or not? Sorry, he's uh -oh. just on the phone right now. Right. Oh, and I see a chat. Wake Forest thinks it looks like grapefruit segments, not an oak leaf from the, uh, from the uh, NSIP case. I like that, too. I don't know, David, because I, I mean, I usually won't consider sarcoid or if it's not the typical distribution, just because most of those cases turn out to not be sarcoid. Yeah, I think, is that... I think this, is, this, is, this, this has, the nodes are really too large on the left for there being nothing on the right. I think... Um, yeah. Really strikingly asymmetric. Yeah, at least that's. But Sorry. certainly, I mean, most. I was on the phone. I think you asked me a question. The um, would you ever even really consider sarcoid when you have asymmetric lymphadenopathy, like anterior mediastinum, maybe left hilum in this case, but nothing on the right or right paratracheal. Absolutely not. I mean, I've seen no, it, I, one I agree. case of unilateral lung involvement with sarcoid, but it's pretty minimal disease. Um, but those nodes are, I mean, with, when they're that big, you would expect to see them on both sides. Yeah. And my logic is, is sarcoid is an inhalational disease and you inhale to both lungs. So you should see the tissue reaction in both lungs. Yeah. There's this strange little divot in his right 
main bronchus that I just noticed. It looks like he's got normal bronchial anatomy. Otherwise, I don't know what that is. Looks like an aborted kinda... uh, anomalous bronchus. Yeah. All right. Let's see. I'm just going to keep going all this backlog of cases that I've accumulated. You probably saw the diagnosis here, but this is the eye test of the day. This is one that you can only really see, I think, on the PA view if you're given a history of Strider, you know, new onset upper airway obstruction. And you can see that there's subtle opacity here projecting over the trachea. Now, the lateral view I love because I think it, jump, it should jump out on the lateral view. You have this more discrete circumscribed thing that, that localizes to the trachea right at the level of the aortic arch. And this patient, let's see, 65. I don't know if they're a smoker or not. In this case, it doesn't really matter just because of the diagnosis. But here you can see how much of his airway is lost by this tumor. It certainly looks like it's arising from the wall of the trachea and has a little bit of vertical extent in both directions. So squamous cell would be the first thing you think of. This turned out to be an adenoid cystic carcinoma, which probably this is some of the perineural extent that you often see with these. It's a little less cylindrical and, and circumferential than some of the ones I've seen, but I think it's a great radiograph, especially on the lateral view for seeing yeah, tracheal abnormalities. And given his age, because, you know, most of the adenoid cystics occur in people under 30. Yeah, I know. Right. Yeah. And non-smokers, younger patients, 30s, I think we've seen some in the 40s. It's really unusual. Yeah. But I, I like your so, point about the perineural extension because, you know, when I, when I talk about the airways to our residents and such, I always point out that the local recurrence is high because of that. Right, and that's often why they're difficult to treat too. Now this one, they did they did a biopsy, and you can see then they had to go do a new biopsy, and that they had you know, extension, perineural invasion was present, extension at the margins. I think I've shown a couple, I mean, we don't see them all that often. I've seen more, some of them that are more circumferential that seem to extend perineural or somehow circumferential just in the axial plane too, but this was just a, a good one more for the radiograph, just how striking it was. So, and just how subtle these airway lesions can be. And this was his post-op, so they've done a good job of resecting this, took out, looks like a portion of his right upper lobe, or his, or his entire right upper lobe. All right, let's see um, this one, just because I showed the other case. I don't even remember what the cause of this was, but I think just... I saved this one because it was old, but it was so pretty. This is a patient. I know this is from the VA. And you can see at this point, symmetric lower lobe consolidation. You know, just get a little bit of surrounding ground glass, and then it just happened to evolve into what we see now as more just nice little symmetric atolls. And this is... This is kind of, Jeff, this is like the NSIP case, just minus the rest of the NSIP. So it's just that band. So I, I like your idea of that other one. Now you call you it the see composing the, oak leaf sign or the eaten grapefruit sign. Huh, the eaten grapefruit, right, the consumed grapefruit sign. Nice. So, but that's just a good one. To, if there, Hopefully there's some residents on here that are seeing just a typical look. And even on this first study, I think, you know, an infectious pneumonia, usually isn't going to be this symmetric. It's not screaming of aspiration because there's not a lot of central lobular nodularity. It's pretty symmetric at this point. So maybe, you know, this is one where I th the helpful, it's helpful to have the discussion with the clinician and find out what their symptoms really are, so, such as cough at this point and not really any severe symptoms. All right, we're just bouncing around here, different cases. This one, this one I should have shown right after the adenoid cystic. I think this one is incredibly difficult to see, and I would not have seen this prospectively and did not. See. I don't know who read this, if I did or not, but this is another patient who came in with airway compromise. You can see there's a little subtle mass effect on the trachea, and then you just don't really see the left wall of the trachea here. And a couple days later, maybe on this two view, you can see that the trachea just kind of disappears. There's a little fullness to the left of the trachea. Uh, and I, I don't remember if this was the first study this patient had, but you can see that he has a circumferential kind of contiguous mass arising from his thyroid gland. I know that just because I know this was a pretty aggressive thyroid cancer. 
you can just see how narrow. I'm just amazed that these patients come in with an, an airway that's that narrow before these diagnoses are made, and just how airway tumors in general can be really delayed diagnoses. But this was some sort of aggressive, I think it was, yeah, it was a squamous cell of the thyroid that came in with this. But I also show it because, because of the airway compromise, he has, at this point has a trach. Now they've treated some of it, but you can see now this was, it gets even more complicated because he now has dependent consolidation in the lower lobes. You can see more bronchocentric. This is a great look for a bronchopneumonia pattern, which is what this turned out to be, even a couple little early little holes here. And then you can see how this evolves over the course of, of 13 days. Now he's got some of these areas of consolidation. And of course, he's sick, you know, similar to the little cavities that Jeff was showing with the septic emboli, except this was not, you know, this was from an airway spread of infection, that this was all, I think it was, it was either pseudomonas. Yeah, it was pseudomonas that they grew. So this was pseudomonas, other virulent organisms, staph we think of with bronchopneumonia pattern in this typical you know, bronchocentric spread of consolidation and pneumonia. So we rarely isolate things from these, but not as good as Wisconsin is at getting bugs out of everything, but this was confirmed pseudomonas and, and bronchopneumonia pattern. All right. Uh, I think that's about it for the ones that I didn't go through last week. So I think I've exhausted everything on here that I didn't talk about before. My brain is now tired because those were really good. <laughs> so Excellent. Thank you very well, much. Thanks, Travis. That's a great case. Yeah, it's nice to see. Uh, welcome to the Wake Forest crew that's on there. It's good to see new people on here. Yeah. So, and, and I know Brant had emailed me before just saying it was a really busy clinical day for him. Sure. So All now right. I've got to reload for next week. Well, Howard's back next week, I believe, so. Yeah, he said he gets back from Tanzania on Sunday. All right. Um, so, so, Jeff, just really quickly, after every, well, as everyone else is signing off, I've got my Synology up.